Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming today to our second installment of our webinar series. Um, so my name is Minky Kuntz, and I'm an application scientist here at Protochips. Today we are doing, as I said, the second installment in this webinar series surrounding sample preparation for in situ transmission electromicroscopy. We felt that this topic was an important one to focus on because uh, sample preparation is a critical component of a workflow that can severely affect reproducibility of an experiment, uh, something that uh, Savannah Turney will talk about today as well, and even the validity of the results. And this could be said for just about any analysis technique, obviously. However, working at the nanoscale like electron microscopy means that even small variables can cause immense differences. Our company chooses to focus on the entire workflow for its in situ TEM, not just providing TEM related hardware. And everything from sample preparation to data collection to scaling from bulk to nano with relevance to the environmental capabilities of our systems and all the way to data management and analysis is all covered. And all of these areas can make or break your success and need uh, consideration um, because the success doesn't simply lie in the spec uh, specifications of the NC2 hardware itself. So again, this series is focused on sample preparation you will learn from really valuable uh, tips and tricks and considerations for all areas of NCTU TEM sample prep. Before I introduce uh, the speaker of today, our star of today, I'm going to have a couple of house, ha household items uh, to cover housekeeping that we need to do. So first of all, everybody is muted due to our audience size to prevent unintentional interruptions while our presenter is giving a talk. If you have a question for her, please enter it in the question box on your GoToWebinar. I will be able to see all of those. And at the end of the talk, we'll be able to address this uh, to Savannah so that she can answer your, um, your questions. There will also be a short survey that pops up after the web webinar. We would greatly appreciate it if you fill that out to help us with any future webinars. And if you need it, a certificate of completion will also come into your email after the webinar. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to let you tell a little bit about our speaker, and then I'm going to hand the mic to her. So, uh, Savannah Turner studied at St. Andrews University for her undergraduate, where she used advanced electromicroscopy to study zeolites and perovskites for catalysis and energy materials. For her PhD research, she pioneered gas cell phase, uh, gas phase TEM at the University of Utrecht in col collaboration with the company Plus F. She used gas and liquid phase CEM to study catalyst synthesis with an emphasis on the addition of water vapor to the gas stream. And since October this year, she has taken a position as the high end EM specialist at the Electron Microscopy Center of Utrecht University, where she assists in advanced TEM research across the field uh, of chemistry and physics. So, Savannah, I'm going to turn off my mic and my camera, and so will Madeline Dix here as well. And um, have a good webinar, everybody. Great. Thank you, Ninka. Thank you for the lovely introduction and thank you for inviting me to give this webinar. Um, I hope everyone can hear me well. Um, but yeah, so today, as Ninka has already said, I am going to be discussing the uh, practical aspects of the planning and preparing and executing of in situ gas phase TM experiments. I would give to give this talk because um, when I first started my PhD uh, on gas cell, we didn't really have any in-group knowledge and there was a lot of mistakes I made and a huge learning curve that I took um, that I'm hoping I can avoid other people having to do. We're all doing that learning curve separately. What happens is we're wasting time. So it's better if I share all the mistakes I made, essentially, this is going to be a presentation on a lot of mistakes. So you don't have to make them. So they're not being made twice. Um, one thing uh, you should know about this presentation and uh, the contents of this webinar is it is primarily aimed at um, the PhDs or postdocs who will actually be using the system. So it's aimed at our sort of boots on the ground soldiers as opposed so much to um, the higher management levels. Uh, I do talk about planning and designing in situ experiments, but my main priority is to give you the tools you need to actually execute one. So it's most useful for people who will be actually executing these experiments. Before I start, I mean, Ninka introduced me. I feel like I should give a couple of words. So I work at the high end DM at uh, Utrecht University. I've moved away from gas cell a little bit now. I still help, but it's not really my thing anymore. Um, I'm now doing a lot of uh, high end microscopy uh, using a spectrum microscope. That's the, what this picture is that you can see here. 
um, and uh, that's my current position. So the contents of this webinar, I've broken it down into sort of three main steps. There's the planning, the preparing, and the executing. Um, and I'm going to talk you through each three of those steps. Um, it is my opinion that the first two are so much more important than the last one. Uh, the planning, the design of an experiment is really, really fundamental to the success of an experiment. Um, the preparation is key to actually getting it to run uh, in the first place, getting your sample into the microscope. And the execution should, in the end, actually be the easiest part. If you've done the first two parts correctly, the execution of your experiment should be relatively straightforward. And to illustrate the process, I'm going to use one of my experiments because I was told to only use things that are already published. So we're going to be using an experiment that I have published. Um, uh, this experiment is the reduction of nickel phyllosilicate. It's a very simple experiment in the sense that on the left, we have nickel phyllosilicate, which is a material um, of sheets and layers that you can see all folded around um, in that image. And on the right, we have uh, nanoparticles grown after reduction. So the reduction takes place at around 700 degrees under a hydrogen atmosphere. For the full information, you can check the paper. But the, the main goal of this is to give you an example to follow what we're doing in this uh, webinar. And all you can see is at the beginning, we have no nanoparticles. At the end, we do have nanoparticles. Very simple. So for the planning stage, um, we will start there. I'm going to ask a bunch of questions and I want you to think along as we go through this webinar about um, how your experiment that you have planned uh, applies to these questions because these questions are going to determine to some extent how easy your in-situ experiment will be. Before I ask these questions there's a couple of essential prerequisites that Ninka already covered in the last webinar but I'm going to remind you which is that your reactant gases have to be compatible with a gas cell. You cannot put in sulfur or chlorine gases really without damaging your gas cell. And that's, and you cannot produce those gases either. So sometimes you also have to think a little bit further. Um, so we do know that water can be a problem. I'll go into that a bit later. Um, another problem that you can have is uh, we, there has been people who have reported uh, carbon ion formation when working with CO gases. So in general, it's really important to make sure that the gases that you have are fundamentally going to actually even work in the cell. And if you have questions about that, you can always ask prototypes because they will be able to answer them. And then some helpful prerequisites, and these are things I'm not going to cover here today, but they don't make your um, experiments impossible, but they make it much more challenging, is to have an air-stable sample because um, you can use air-unstable samples by loading them in a, in a glove box, but it's not going to be a lot of fun. It is quite challenging, and that's a topic for another webinar, I think. Um, and the other thing that might help is to have your particle size small enough to fit in your gas cell. Um, obviously, if your particles are larger than that, you can do fib lamella, which will be covered in the next webinar, but I won't be talking about that today. I'm going to assume that your particle size is small enough that it already fits in your gas cell. So the first question I want to think about is, um, does your reaction that you intend on studying take place at one bar of pressure? and at a temperature between 100 degrees and 1,000 degrees. So why do I say one bar and why do I say 100 degrees? Um, we're gonna cover that now uh, because in theory, we can run reactions at room temperature, but if you are, understand what I'm gonna talk about next, you'll see why that actually is quite challenging to do. So I'm gonna jump straight in with an experiment I actually performed with Ninka, who just spoke to you right now. Um, we performed this as a, I think, a Friday afternoon experiment uh, back in the first year of my PhD when she was in, I think, the final year of hers. I took her sample and um, I wanted to just see if I could do an in situ experiment with her sample. But here what you see is mostly just window. And when we were trying to run her experiment, what we came across is enormous amounts of contamination. You can see this on the window on the left, the, on the image on the left, you can see uh, the, the circle, which is the, the window of our chip. And you can see two areas. One has been scanned at room temperature on the left, um, and one has been scanned at 300 degrees. I'm just going to put the pointer on actually, and I'll make it easier. One has been scanned at room temperature, and one has been scanned at 300 degrees. And you can see contamination in both locations. And we were, uh, it ruined our experiment, which, okay, fine, it was a Friday afternoon experiment. We weren't expecting much from it. But 
Um, when we did EDX on these particular areas, we noticed something important. So if you see on the right, you can see the EDX maps for uh, the different areas that we've scanned. And as you can see, the nitrogen is everywhere. The carbon, however, is only after 300 degrees scanning. So on the right hand side, that area of contamination is corresponds to carbon. But when we scanned at room temperature, we had this enormous thick layer of something appear. And what we realized is that that something is silica. What is the difference between room temperature and 300 degrees? Well, obviously, the main thing we could come up with was probably that it was water contamination. So we started looking into this and thinking, wait, if water is forming silica from silicon nitride window plus water plus beam seems to be forming the silica. And we reported this to um, quite a few people. We brought it up at conferences. We brought it up to professors. And we were sort of told, oh, no, that don't be silly. That's not possible. Um, but since then, luckily, thanks to Ninka, I found out that uh, at a variety of universities, several independent universities have come across the same finding. So it is not, we were not going insane. This was real. That if you have water at all present in your gas cell um, and you scan, probably what will happen is you build up this silica coating, which then you're, nothing happens in terms of your reaction. This is really, really important. Um, and so we, we looked into this a bit further. So when I was actually running my gas cell experiments with my sample that I mentioned before, I did quite a lot of st stability tests. And so I tested it under vacuum, but vacuum here refers to four millibar of argon because it's actually in the gas cell. I tested it under argon flow at one bar. I tested it under static argon at one bar, and I tested it under argon flow at 300 degrees. And it's not very clear from these images, but if you were to zoom in very closely, you would see that um, all of these damage except for the 300 degree sample. So all of these uh, materials have been quite significantly damaged by the beam under all of these conditions, vacuum, argon, and argon flow, um, but not at 300 degrees, which again points to water. So we guessed that we have water damage and water damage was an integral uh, part of the damage of our samples. You might have heard about water damage being important before from liquid cell TM. So in liquid cell, they know very well, and I'm not an expert on liquid cell, but um, they know very well that under an electron beam, uh, water undergoes radiolysis to form a, a lot of radicals, which are all reported here on the left. Um, this is a, a very famous process in liquid cell, and it's also been done once in gas cell by a, a colleague of an ex colleague of mine called Mark Meyerink. They did it in an ETEM where they added some water vapor to silica spheres, and as you can see here in these images on the right, they saw enormous amounts of sintering of their silica when they had water vapor present, which they didn't see in the absence of water. So where does this water come from? Um, so the first thing is it could be coming from our sample itself. So it's highly likely that we have water in a physisorbed and chemisorbed state on the surface of metal oxides, on the surface of our materials. And it's really important, um, therefore, to remove this water through a drying step at the beginning of our reaction before we even do anything. Um, so that was our first theory. But the second place that you can see water is, of course, from leaks. Um, so one, the reason I mentioned before that we like to run all of our reactions at one bar or above, ideally ever so slightly above one bar, is because if we leak in by being on, at, at below one bar, we leak water from the atmosphere into our lines through um, either here, our lines where they connect to the actual holder, or in the manifold itself, if it's not 100% leak tight, you'll leak water into those lines and you cannot get rid of that water. So well, working at overpressure means that as long as, even if you do have a minor leak somewhere, it doesn't matter because it's gonna leak out. So we like to run all of our reactions at one bar and we like to run all of our reactions with a drying step first of at least 100 degrees to remove any physisorbed or chemisorbed water from the surface if possible. So the next question we can go through in terms of the planning is how long does your reaction take? And this is a really, it seems like a really obvious question, but it is one to definitely take a minute and consider before you actually run your reaction. So. The easiest, obviously, is going to be if your reaction takes minutes or if it takes hours, because that's an amount of time that you're willing to sit by the microscope and watch your experiment. Seconds, however, is going to be really, really, really difficult to capture 
Um, and days is going to be uh, obviously really difficult to capture for a different reason because you're going to have to sit there for days. And booking a microscope for days is not always easy. Um, so just to give you an idea of the length of time that certain reactions take, um, reduction in oxidation, uh, at least in situ experiments, is usually very, very, very fast. So my colleague, my colleague here, Min, Min Tang, I think she now works um, over in Antwerp. Uh, she, for example, studied redox reactions, and what she saw is that the reactions happened sort of from one frame to the next quite often. You went from an oxide to uh, the reduced metal. Then in the center, we have uh, to correspond to minutes and hours. Um, I have a colleague uh, who now works in Japan called Tom Welling, um, who worked on ca carbon nanotube growth. Uh, his reactions took a really nice length of time. They took sort of minutes, uh, hours. That was really practical. And then on the right here, another colleague of mine who's about to defend her PhD um, studied deactivation and sintering. Now, in real catalytic reactions or in real reactions, this usually takes days or weeks even when they do these runs. Um, so she had a bit more of a challenge as well to get this in situ data. Um, just because you're at the wrong end of, uh, you're in the wrong location on this, on this time span, doesn't mean you can't run your experiments. So if you have uh, very fast reactions, you can use slightly lower temperatures, that might help. You could use lower pressures if you're 100% sure you have no leaks. Um, and you can also lower your beam dose, which might help to slow the reaction down. Whereas if you have uh, reactions that will take a long time, you can increase your temperature, you can increase your pressure, you can increase your beam dose. So it's a good idea to think about how you're going to have to modulate your, um, your length of time of your reaction and how you're going to capture that. So the next um, question I would like to ask regarding the ease of your experiment is what type of changes are going to take place during the reaction? It's really good to think about this because a lot of people say, oh, we have this change that we know take, takes place, but the question is, is how are you going to study it? Some changes are really easy to study. For example, morphological changes, which I put in green here because they are the most obvious, right? If your sample is changing shape or size, it's fairly clear what's happening. It's very measurable. More complicated is um, things like compositional and structural changes. So if you have a very atomic resolution, at atom rearrangement, that's going to be slightly harder. If you have um, changes in composition, EDX can, scans can take a long time. Uh, that can make it also quite hard. And the other one that people often forget about is large 3D changes. Um, I'm going to go over you an example of that now uh, in a bit. But First, I want to talk about the composition, because the composition changes uh, are usually a little bit challenging, especially if you are performing reactions under argon. We often use argon as our dilution gas because it seems to be the most inert, but it also has the most overlaps in EDX. Um, and for example, we very silly decided to stick palladium nickel nanoparticles in to try and do in situ EDX. And of course, argon overlaps exactly with palladium which is a, a really big problem for us. Um, but it also overlaps quite badly with silver and uh, cadmium. Um, obviously there are other overlaps to consider, but the most annoying one we usually find is uh, argon. And then for the 3D changes, which can be quite challenging. Um, again, I brought up this experiment from uh, Tom Welling, it's published, um, you can check him out online, the reference there. But he studied carbon nanofiber growth. Um, and one thing we didn't, Quite consider before we studied carbon nanofiber growth was the fact that um, for some reason the room is not running uh, is the fact that the carbon nanofibers also grow in the z direction they also grow in 3d and they grow up and the, you lose focus on them and it's very difficult to track that it's also very difficult to track ones that haven't grown you know that seem to be growing flat are they growing flat it's very hard to tell so it's really important to consider how you're going to study 3d changes one thing you can do is if you have an inspection holder, you can look at your chip afterwards and um, use that to uh, figure out whether or not you have uh, 3D changes by doing some tomography on your chip afterwards. But other than that, it's actually quite a challenging thing to do. So the next question to answer is what scale are these changes on? Neither of the answers here are actually wrong, but it is much easier if your changes are bigger. Um, and the reason for that is uh, drift. So Ninka already said 
um, that with temperature you see a quite significant drift. I think it's about a degree, uh, sorry, a one nanometer in the z direction per degree, or might be two, I can't quite remember. But you see quite a significant z drift as you change temperature. But the other thing that happens is when you introduce the gas, the windows bulge and you um, your sample shifts. So as you change gases, you also uh, shift your sample quite significantly. And that is actually much harder to follow. So I'm going to show you a video. The video on the right now is about to play. You can see it's quite under focused at the beginning, but oh, sorry, over focused at the beginning, but it gets better, I promise. Um, but you're going to see what happens where I have used changing the gas to start my experiment. Um, and you'll see that I completely lose my sample. It's playing now. See? And it's gone. And I went back. So I've sped it up quite significantly, but we go quite far out when you lose your experiment. Um, what this means for the planning aspect is it's always going to be easier to introduce your gas at a lower temperature and then ramp up from that temperature than it is to start by setting the temperature you want and then suddenly introduce your gas. So it always works much easier the other way around. Um, I would always prefer to go uh, introduce my gas at 300 degrees and then ramp to 600 degrees than go the other way around. What do you know about the stability of your sample? This is such a huge question to answer and it's such a difficult question to answer and it's where I think as in situ microscopists we spend most of our time is answering these questions because before you can start your experiment you need to know a little bit about the stability of your sample. So I'm going to go through some of the questions I answered when I was planning this particular experiment, but all these questions are going to be really, really fundamental to you. Um, so in my case, the question I answered was, I had to answer was, uh, does the reaction take place ex situ? It seems obvious, but you know, it's a fundamental question. How, can I do this in the lab before I try and do it on the nanoscale? And the answer was yes, luckily. So here you can see the before and after images I showed you before. Then I had to answer the question of, does it take place ex situ, but on a chip? Does the fact that it's spread on a chip make any difference? Um, luckily, it, in my case, it didn't make any difference. I still grew my nanoparticles, so that was great. The next question was, does it take place in situ, because you have very different hydrodynamics, but without any beam present? So can I just make it happen inside the gas cell without a beam on? Again, in my case, thankfully, the answer was yes. And another question, regarding the beam stability is, is my sample even beam stable under vacuum? You know, before I even add gases, it's important to know, can I look at it for any period of time without it disintegrating? And this image is acquired from that particular experiment. And the answer again, thankfully, was yes. Then, as we saw before, I performed those experiments where I varied the gas and the temperature um, and to see whether it was stable under argon, to see whether it's stable under hydrogen. I ran a bunch of experiments to see if my sample survived with beam and gas, and this is really, really important. Um, and thankfully, there was hardly any influence of the beam and the gas, but it, it can be really a make it or break it experiment, I think, this one, and it's really disappointing when it goes the wrong way. Uh, don't get me wrong, a lot of my experiments, I have seen it go the opposite way, and it's, yeah, it, it's a bit of a killer, really. And the last one is, is your reaction enhanced by the beam? Um, so, as you saw before, um, when I played that video before, um, by the time I'd refound my sample, my uh, sample had reduced and we did have nanoparticles. This was very frustrating for me because it meant that my particle growth happened really, really fast. And here I was working very close to the temperature at which the particles should start growing ex situ according to my ex situ experiments. There is a little trick you can use to um, bypass the fact that your beam may be influencing somewhat your particle growth or your, your, ex, your reaction that you're expecting to see. And that's to work way above the temperature at which your reaction would normally happen. Because when you're far, far above the temperature at which your reaction would normally happen, you get the added benefit of being like, well, the beam is very minimal in terms of its contribution to the reaction compared to the thermodynamics of the fact that I'm working at such a high temperature. And that's one nice way to uh, bypass a little bit, I mean, still acknowledge the effect of the beam, but um, get some slightly more re reliable data is to work at a higher temperature than you want so that you can, um, so that your beam contribution to that reaction becomes negligible 
compared to the contribution of the actual thermodynamics from the heat itself. So um, lastly, do you have a quantitative or qualitative method you, to measure the change you're expecting to see? This is a bonus question. This isn't necessary. So many papers are published where they didn't measure what they saw. They just uh, saw what they saw and reported it. But for that, you have to be a bit lucky. You have to accidentally see something that's not really been seen before. It really helps, especially when you're a PhD candidate, especially when you're uh, hoping to publish or to tell a good story to have a plan to me measure the output of your experiment. So what do I plan on seeing? Do I plan on seeing a contrast change? Am I gonna measure that contrast change? Do I plan on seeing a particle size change? Am I gonna measure that? Um, am I gonna see a quantitative EDX change? You know, all of that stuff, it really helps to have pinned down the method you're going to use to analyze your data because it will inform your experiment planning. So, in conclusion of the planning phase, we've been through quite a lot of points and I hope that you've managed to um, apply these somewhat to the experiment you yourself are thinking of. But um, at the end of your planning phase, I like to have a diagram like this before I go into my actual experiment. And uh, so I like to have a diagram that shows um, the plan of what I'm going to do with the temperature. So in my case, because I love to include that drying step to prevent any silica buildup, that we mentioned, I like to have a good long drying phase at 300 degrees here because my sample can take it. Yours might be down at 100 degrees. It might be somewhere in between, I don't know. But I like to have a good long flushing and drying phase uh, at the beginning where I make sure I've removed any water so that that's not influencing my reaction. And then uh, I like to ramp very rapidly to the temperature that I'm going to run my experiment at. So uh, for me, that was uh, 500 degrees in this particular experiment, but it doesn't really matter what temperature that is, but it's nice to have a plan of when that's going to happen relative to everything else. The next thing is I know that I'm going to do my drying under argon, and then I'm going to do my reduction under hydrogen. I like to change my gas, obviously, before I ramp the temperature, as we just discussed, so that we avoid losing our sample in that time period. And then the next thing I like to include in these diagrams is an irradiation scheme. So this is a plan here you can see in yellow where I plan on having the beam turned on uh, in these particular experiments. So I like to have a time to turn the beam on before uh, at the end of the drying phase. So never turn the beam on before you've dried your sample, otherwise you're just going to build up that silica and then nothing will happen because you have a silica coating over everything. So once I've finished my drying, that's when I turn my beam on and I find my sample. Then I switch my gases to the gases I'm interested in. Then I turn my beam on again and I find my sample again because as I switch gases, I've created some shift in the, uh, in the windows. And then I'll ramp to temperature and run my experiment. So that's the kind of diagram that's very useful to have because then when you're sat behind the microscope, you're not thinking, oh, what am I going to do? You have a plan and you can uh, just follow it. So now we're going to move on to the preparing part of this uh, of this of this webinar, and I think this is where it becomes really practical for uh, people who actually do the experiments. Um, so I'm going to talk about how to prepare your sample. I'm going to talk about how to prepare your gas cell, how to clean it, how to prepare your manifold, get your gases ready. I'm going to talk about how to um, prepare your microscope so that you have the right conditions ready before you go into your experiment, because this for me is the bulk of the work. This for me is something that actually starts the day before the experiment even starts. So the day before the experiment, I like to have all of this stuff pretty much lined up so that I'm ready to go on the day that I have the microscope booked. So the first thing I like to do the day before is clean my part, um, especially if I do not know who's used it before me. Uh, so one thing I always do um, is I clean my O-rings by sonicating them in ethanol. I know that there is the trick with the uh, parafilm. I personally find that it's not the best method if you want to have really, really leak tight O-rings. Um, that's my personal experience. Some people have no issues whatsoever with just using parafilm to clean their O-rings. I find that sonicating mine just for like a couple of minutes in ethanol is really important. Why? because there are two main things that cause leaks. Um, the first one is shards of silicon nitride, and the second one is shards of sharp sample. And uh, both of those, I find are more easily removed by the sonication than they are by 
um, using just the power film. Obviously, it's entirely your choice. Um, but the other one that I really, really recommend, and this sounds really insane, I think, if you're not used to it, is to sonicate the tweezers. Um, the tips of the tweezers, the carbon tip tweezers, they uh, degrade over time. If you look at them under a microscope, what you'll see is they, they get all these little flakes and, and shards, and that's another huge cause of leaks. So if you're seeing leaks because of your O-ring um, being contaminated, it's probably because your tweezers have started to degrade over time. So you can either buy replacement tips, or if you just want to do a quick method, I always sonicate my tweezers before I run my experiment so that any loose shards that are going to come off have already come off. They're already gone and I don't have to worry about them. So I just sonicate those in some ethanol as well. I also, and here is, uh, you have to be a little bit brave to do this, but it is worth doing if you don't know who's used the holder before you or it's been a long time since it's been cleaned. I usually sonicate my holder in ethanol between uh, experiments. So um, for that, all I'm doing is uh, I put a little vial of ethanol in my sonicator bath. Um, this is me looking a little bit younger than I am today. Um, and I dip the tip of the holder up to this line. So just below the gel pads, that's where I aim for, in the ethanol, preferably very clean ethanol. And I sonicate it for, I mean, 20, 30 seconds, nothing more. But the idea is, is sometimes in the grooves, you will get silicon nitride shards from where people have incorrectly picked up the chips and chipped them. Um, or you will get little bits of tweezer plastic, uh, is it plastic or carbon? I'm never really sure. Um, you get little bits of that um, and it all just builds up over time. And it's a really good idea to just regularly give this a clean. You can then choose to um, dry it with an air gun or dry it with uh, one of those uh, little spray bottles of compressed air. Some people don't like the air guns. I think it depends on the quality of your lines really in your building that you're working in. Um, and I like to dry that quite thoroughly. And like I said, often I do this the day before so that it's got really good time overnight to dry. For cleaning the chips, um, Ninka already discussed all the benefits of plasma cleaning in the last webinar. I'm not going to go over it again. Um, but what she did ask me to show is uh, this brass dish that we have here. Um, so I plasma clean my chips on this uh, little brass dish, which was actually designed in-house. And apparently a lot of people have the same plasma cleaner as we do. Um, I think ours has actually seen better days, but it still works. Um, and you uh, can attach this brass dish into this holder with a screw and then uh, it will clamp the dish in place and then you can put your um, chips into the plasma cleaner much easier. If you can find somewhere to make you something like this, I would really recommend it because trying to slide them in on glass slides um, is not the easiest thing to do. Um, as I said before, it's really important to make sure we never chip those silicon nitride uh, windows when we're picking them up because that is how you get the O-ring leaks most of the time, those chips are sharp. So now, one of the other problems we often see when we're preparing samples is getting the sample onto the window in the first place. So um, obviously nowadays we have inspection holders. If you, if you have an inspection holder, that's great. You can use that to check whether you have sample on your windows, but not everyone has an inspection holder. When we first started, we did not have an inspection holder. So we developed a little hack, I guess, to find out whether we had sample on our windows. And the way we do that is we use a stereo microscope, which you can see the screen of here. So this has the chip that we are going to do um, study. And here you can see the windows uh, with the little six little holes. And uh, my colleague in this video is going to drop cast um, the sample onto the chip. And if you have the right lighting, what you will see is there as the ethanol evaporates our chip uh, our drop casting solution is usually in ethanol as the ethanol evaporates the uh, there will be surface tension on the liquid which will reflect light and that means you can see where the sample has um, landed essentially so you can see it now with the bigger particles that there's the surface tension but as it dries if you watch that really carefully you can capture the moment at which it dries and you can see whether it has landed on your six windows or not if you don't have an inspection holder, but you do have an optical microscope lying around, this is a really easy way to try and know whether or not you've got the sample in the place that you want to have the sample. And um, you should do it, I think, again in a second in this video so you can capture it again. Yeah, so here's the droplet that's landed. And 
as it dries, you can really see every single little particle and where it has landed. If you are preparing samples, it is usually better not to do more than one or two drops, um, because after that, what happens is the particles start to land always in the same places. So you just build up bigger and bigger clumps of particles as they stick together, as opposed to getting a finer and finer spread and more and more particles on your chips. So you just increase your risk of leaks as opposed to getting more sample. If you have very, very sharp samples, uh, things like magnesia, ciria, titania, it is extra important that you get a really small uh, fraction of uh, particles. You can get little um, filters that you uh, use a syringe to press through that will uh, sort out so you don't have too many large particles in your sample. But it is really, really important to try and um, practice this part and get the right sample dispersion on your chip. Then assembling the holder. So this is a very easy um, part if you've got experience. It's probably more challenging if you've not, but I'm not gonna go into too much depth because I think Nika already went through it in her webinar. But one thing I do that is maybe different to how uh, Nika has described it is I usually fish the O-ring out of the ethanol in which I've stomachated my tweezers with the tweezers and I place it on wet and I allow that to dry. Again, sometimes overnight, however long you need. I understand that this is gonna make people nervous about carbon contamination. We never see the carbon contamination. Um, you, we give it a quick dry with a spray of air. Um, and if you leave it long enough, it's usually absolutely fine. What you can do if you're really concerned is uh, spray a little bit of air through the ports at the back of the holder so that the air flushes through these ports here. But realistically, we've never really seen a problem from this. Um, we see more problems from having leaks than we do from uh, making sure that our O-ring goes straight onto the holder without any risk of picking up dust or dirt. Um, we find this is a really crucial step for us. And so for assembling the holder, again, not gonna go into too much depth, but you would put your uh, little chip on first. When you do this, it's really important to make sure it's tucked nicely under the o-ring so it's a as you slide it in it really helps I, I really hope that i had good solid hands in this particular movie um it really helps to make give it a good press on the sides and just tuck it in and make sure it's really securely being held uh, because that can be a source of broken chips and um then you would put your top uh your top chip on this is I personally usually find this chip to be slightly harder than the bottom chip because this chip tends to slide around a little bit more and be less stuck. Um, but yeah, you have to nudge it into place until it is perfectly lined up. You, If you have got an optical microscope to do this under, again, it's going to make your life easier. You can really see what's going on. You can really see once the window becomes transparent to light now, you can see if you've got the two chips nicely lined up. I personally find the optical microscope helps a lot with everything. Um, you can also see the quality of the tweezers there, that over time they start shredding, they get much worse than that, believe me. Then you will screw on your um, your screws and the tops. Like I said, this is the point at which if you have sharp, sam uh, sharp samples, it's going to break your windows. If you have uh, pointy things, uh, ciria, titania, magnesia, they're really, really much harder to prepare. So if you're having a really hard time preparing those samples, Believe me, it's not your fault. It's everyone has the same problem. Um, it they you just have to be really really careful with the particle size, especially when you screw down. Uh, it will just smash if you're not careful. So for leak checking, we use a high cube. Um, if you have a high cube, that really helps. Um, and uh, we usually pump our high cube without a holder in, so just with a stub in first, just to make sure that it does go down to the uh, value that we want it to go down to, which is at least four e to the minus six um, hectopascals. That's the main goal for us. However, and, and then we would switch to the holder. So we put the holder in, we put the holder in with the back closed, and um, we pump that down for as you know uh, until it for 15 minutes until it reaches that value. And then we open the back of the holder. And what you're gonna see on the right here in this movie um, is what happens when you have a leak, because here you can see on the right that we have um, four e to the minus six. And as I play, you'll see that, oh, you'll see that I open the back of the holder and 
it jumps straight up. So this is a bad leak. If this happens, it's a bad leak. This is there's no there's no continuing with your experiment. But unfortunately, the high cube doesn't always catch every leak that you could have. Um, so I'm going to demonstrate in this next window. On most microscopes, and I've checked this, um, on most microscopes, especially if you're working with a Thermo Fisher-like microscope, you should have something installed called the vacuum logger. Now, if you don't have it installed, there's a good chance you can get Thermo Fisher to install it, because I think it's a fairly like standard piece of software on your computer. For jail, there is an equivalent. Um, I don't fully understand the equivalent because we don't have any JL microscopes here, but um, there is an equivalent that you can install. And I, when I insert my holder into the microscope, I always have the vacuum logger running. And the reason I have the vacuum logger running is because I want to see the behavior of the holder in the microscope. So on the right here, you can see a sealed um, holder. So this point where the vacuum has leapt up is where we inserted the holder. And if your holder is sealed, you get this perfect flat line, which should gradually go down over time. On the left, you can see a leaking holder. So we've inserted the holder here. Um, and at first it went up a bit and then down a bit. It looks quite promising. Then it did a big dip. And then as I pumped the holder down into to vacuum, so I took the inside of the holder to vacuum, you can see that the vacuum of the microscope improves massively. And I'm thinking, oh, this is really great, really great. But then as I start changing gases, we get this up and down and it's leaking. So you can't just go on, oh, but the microscope hasn't crashed, so therefore it isn't leaking. Um, it's, it can still be leaking, but your microscope still functions perfectly fine because the vacuum pumps of the microscope will compensate for small leaks. And I like to know whether or not I have a small leak. Um, so this, this vacuum logger for us is pretty invaluable. We use this the whole time to make sure that we have really, really leak tight, really, really sealed holders. Um, one thing you will note is if you uh, do this leak type of leak checking in the microscope, different gases leak to different amounts. Um, so uh, hydrogen will leak the worst by a long way because it's very small uh, molecules. Um, things like oxygen tend to be quite good. Even so, you may have leak. You may have no leak under one gas, and then leaks with other gases. That's something also to bear in mind. So I like to keep this up. I like to watch it. I like to keep an eye on it the whole way through. So now we've got a leak tight holder. Hopefully, <laughs> now we need to get um, our manifold clean. So um, manifold. They they just there is no. My my professor said to me, there's no such thing as a leak tight line. Um, because, well, I mean, he's not wrong. At the end of the day, all lines are porous. At the end of the day, there will be exchange of gases. And at the end of the day, there is no such thing as a leak type line. So I like to check my lines. Um, so this is the lines from the manifold to the bottle. So those lines, which you can do by closing the bottle and then performing a leak check. Um, so make sure you've closed that bottle and the regulator properly. And then you can perform a leak check on your input lines, S1, S2, or S3. I do this whenever I see weird behavior or whenever it's been a long time since it was last leaked. Um, I, love to I love to check these lines because I often find that they have sprung leaks in the time between uses. I don't know why. Um, it's, it's no one's fault. It's just how it is. Uh, but these lines, they're the ones that we've assembled ourselves and they do tend to, you know, occasionally spring leaks. Do remember to close the bottle because otherwise you just empty your bottle during the leak check and that is really bad and not going to make you any friends. Um, but uh, yeah, I check these whenever I see weird behavior. And then bake outs I do between gas changes. So I like to run a bake out when I have changed the gas lines on the back. And that's because I think that we may have introduced some water when we do change the gas lines on the back of the manifold. To avoid that, I like to run a bake out, usually overnight. This doesn't say overnight, but normally I would run it overnight. Um, and also, if it's just been sat there for a long time, it's a good idea to run a bake out between uh, those kind of uh, changes. But before every single experiment, I flush the whole system. So this is really essential. I flush and make sure that we have fresh gas from the bottle that's not been sat in any lines. It's not been sat anywhere. I make sure that the whole system has been flushed. I like to go from one millibar to one bar in terms of my pump purge cycles. So I run pump purge cycles. You can run as many as you can get away with, will always be better. 
because it will always be making your system cleaner. It will always be flushing out um, any contaminants in there, especially if you've had different gases in before. We actually keep, we have two mixing tanks, um, obviously on the manifold. Um, we usually keep one for oxygen based uh, gases and we have one for uh, reducing gases. Um, so sometimes we don't flush if, if if we're not running oxygen gases, we won't flush the oxygen uh, tank and we'll just keep the reducing tank or vice versa. But realistically, I flush all of these every single time as much as I can get away with before the experiment because it makes a huge difference to the success rate in my experience. So we've prepared our sample and our holder. We've prepared our manifold. So the last thing we need to prepare is going to be the microscope itself. Um, before I insert the in situ holder, so this should actually be done first, um, I always put in a different sample and I set up my imaging conditions. Um, I align the microscope in the mode that I'm planning on using um, and I set up my uh, conditions for what kind of images I'm going to be taking, so uh, the acquisition times, things like that. I set up my preview, which is uh, recording videos, how many, how many images per minute, per second, etc., etc. I set up my electron dose that I plan on using, um, and I do all of this prior with, with a completely different sample before I insert my holder. It helps. You don't want to be doing this in situ. You want to just be focused on your experiment. You shouldn't have to realign it, ideally, so um, I find this is better. There is, of course, I think in the in situ world, a bit of an argument about what's better, TM or STEM mode for in situ experiments. Both have their pros and cons. Um, the pros for TEM mode is obviously you can get faster frame rates, you can image much uh, quicker, so you can get better, you know, you can get better time resolution on your reactions. And you have a beam effect that's not moving, it's a constant, even beam effect. So if you do have a beam effect, at least it's not changing. Some cons though, obviously you've got less contrast, you can't do EDX very easily, uh, well, at least not EDX maps, um, and it's quite hard to follow like atomic resolution changes. In STEM mode, um, the pros that you can have are obviously higher contrast, um, you get better elemental maps, and you can get better atomic resolution, at least often um, in aberration corrective microscopes. But the cons are, of course, you have that, that slower frame rate, you can't ac acquire as many uh, images per second per minute as you can in TEM mode, so you tend to miss things. And of course, your beam effect is moving, and it's quite hard to explain that, especially if you have any sort of beam effects going on very hard to know um, yeah it's very hard to compare it with uh, the ex situ results for dose management in both cases it's a good idea to have a little think about the electron dose you're going to be using and um, in the TEM mode you would want to calculate it from the screen current um, and if you work with a thermo Fisher microscope there is an option called intensity limit uh, that you can find on the software on the uh, microscope software which sets a limit to the intensity that you can use. So you can never accidentally go over the dose that you've found. Um, and then in STEM mode, obviously you're going to use the screen current and also your dwell time to calculate your um, electron doses. And that's a little bit more complicated and not something you want to be doing at the same time as running your experiment. So it's nice to have all of this out the way sorted before you even get started. Um, here you can see an example uh, on the left of an experiment I did in situ on a zeolite sample. In TEM mode, I thought it was the best mode for this particular sample, um, and it wasn't because once I switched to STEM mode, on the right you can see we have loads of platinum nanoparticles that have grown everywhere. Um, and sometimes you just don't know until you run your experiment what's going to be the best option. So sometimes you do end up repeating just purely because you follow your instincts and it does just go wrong in the end. So the last step, the last part of um, this webinar, I'm gonna talk about is the execution part. And I mentioned at the beginning that I believe this should be the easiest part. And I still do. I really do believe this should be the easiest part because if you've done all of those previous steps, if you have everything lined up, ready to go, you know your sample stability, you know your experimental conditions, you've got a plan, it should be really easy. Um, so you would then insert the holder, and that's a, obviously a very important step. And we generally attach the lines in, and then we run a leak check on those lines, the lines to the back of the holder. I run a leak check on those lines 
every single time. And the reason why I do that is because those lines are new every single time you assemble the holder. So if you have a leak, that leak, you have no way of knowing it until you've ruined your experiment. So that those lines get checked as the first thing on every single experiment. I don't necessarily do the 10 minute leak check, but I do pump it down to like 0 0.01 millibar. If it goes down that far, then you know that it's tight. Um, and then the next thing I would do is tape my lines. I don't have an image of this, but I would tape my lines up against the microscope because the vibrations from the lines hanging can cause vibrations in your experiment. And then you can have really, really dodgy videos coming out at the end because you don't have, uh, you've got these vibrations following through. So we just use duct tape, it's that simple, but we duct tape our lines to the microscope so that they're nice and stable. Um, so yeah, here you can see where I would leak check the line. So I go down to 0 0.01 millibar and I check, well, I don't actually check for 10 minutes. I just wait and see if it goes down that far. Um, but making sure that those lines are really uh, tight to the back of the holder is really, really important. Uh, something you should know is the ferrules, if you get new ones, they have like a breaking in period where you have to really, really tighten them and it's a bit scary. Um, so if you get new ones, really extra careful and check this because they can, yeah, they can spring leaks quite quickly. And then it's just as simple as following your plan because you have a plan, you've made a plan, you, you come in with your diagram, you know what you're going to do. You have your time allocated for finding the sample. You run your drying step. I know it's so tempting the second you get the holder in the microscope to switch the beam on and see your sample, but really hold off, run that drying step, run, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, get rid of that water because it, it really will make or break your experiment. And then um, after that, you've got some time, or at least I always allocate time for finding the sample. When I first started with Institute, I found finding the sample one of the most challenging parts. So I've developed a bit of a technique for finding the sample. Um, you don't have to follow this. If you're someone who just switches on the beam and already sees your six windows in the center immediately, great. Our microscope isn't calibrated like that. So we often end up um, somewhere off uh, the window. If you end up in the black where you see nothing at all, um, then I would just use the search here on the left. Apparently there's also something similar in JL microscopes to double click and move around until I find uh, the window. Once I've done that, I and I'm actually somewhere on the window and I can see I'm seeing something like here or etc. Um, I then find a black edge and I follow around until I get to these, uh, it's called the bow tie, I think officially, but until you get to this bow tie of, of grayed out area, which is thicker, I think it's the silicon carbide. And then from that, I will follow around and I will add the locations to my search window here on the left. Um, I will add the locations of the corners of this bow tie. So I will find out where these locations are. And this is incredibly helpful because then all you have to do is double click in the center and you will probably be over one of your six windows. It's a time saving technique and it can, yeah, it can really make life much easier. Once I land on a window, so say these red ones down the bottom here, I will then not look at all <laughs> until the end of my experiment um, at, the t at the ones that are furthest away so that we have an irradiated zone and a reference zone. So I will not look at these until I'm done with my experiment in the irradiated area. So I've got a really good comparison and those areas have never been seen. You may notice that in order to do this, you have to never go to low, low magnification. It is a little bit tricky. It is a little bit tricky to do this, but it can make a big difference because um, if you want to compare irradiated and non-irradiated, it is very important that the non-irradiated area has never been irradiated. So um, if you followed all of this, uh, hopefully what you should end up with at the end is a working experiment. And I've been showing the example of my experiment this whole way through. So I feel like it would be unfair not to show you what um, I've got in the end. So here is mine. As you can see, my particles do grow over time. Um, we start, I'll play it twice so you can see it properly. Um, but you have, you start with no particles and over time you grow particles. And from this, we were managed to extract data and we managed to extract um, kinetics and a lot of things. Not super important for this, but if you 
really carefully follow the steps that I've described. I really hope that it helps you get closer to a working experiment to um, to, to, to getting some results uh, and to kill some of that learning curve that we all face when we first start, especially if you're the first person to be using the system in the group that you're working in. This might be, this might jump you forward by a couple of months so you make a few less mistakes uh, than I did, hopefully. So in conclusion, um, good experimental, de experimental design is very much key for success. Uh, so the planning phase is so important. The plan, the design of your experiment, how you're going to do it, all of your stability checks, they seem frustrating, but they really are worth it in the end. Um, the preparation is uh, where all the skill comes in, uh, cleaning those parts and flushing your manifold, preparing your microscope. It really helps to have all of those steps down, have a plan for them and get them done, possibly the day before if you can, so that you really are ready on the day. And if you do this all correctly, the execution should be quick, it should be easy, and um, you should have working experiments and hopefully lots of papers, fingers crossed for you. Um, so uh, on that note, thanks for listening and um, I will pass you back to Nika. Thank you so much for that really, really great detailed uh, webinar today. Um, so for then, we are going to wait for some questions to come in. There's already one or two come in that I'm going to read to you, if that's OK. So uh, mm -hmm. one question, if anybody has questions, by the way, you can just type them into the question box uh, in GoToWebinar and then I can answer all the questions uh, or answer, give them to Savannah and then she can answer the questions. So um, you said that you prefer to dry the sample at 300 degrees Celsius in an inert atmosphere before starting your reaction. How would you approach uh, mitigating silica contamination if your experiment requires water vapor, for example? Good question. Um, so I actually have a paper coming out very, very soon uh, where I did the same reaction you just saw, but I added water vapor intentionally. Um, and so if I bring you back to this, so we, we do this but with water vapor to see what happens to the particle size, what happens to the reduction conditions. Um, adding water vapor, because I was told not to add anything published, uh, I haven't. Uh, adding water vapor is challenging, I'm not gonna lie to you. You do have some beam effects caused by the radiolysis of the water. One thing that um, we did find that helped was to add hydrogen. Um, I don't fully understand it, but uh, when we have hydrogen gas present, as well as water vapor, we generally see a mitigation of the water vapor induced beam effect. Um, I think it's because the recombination of the, so the hydrogen splits and the water splits by the beam, but then they recombine much faster when you have an excess of hydrogen. I don't know, this is not like fully scientific at this point, um, but it is something that we have seen that really does help. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, so uh, that's great. And I also quickly want to add it from our side. If you do want a very, just a very quick plug, if you do want a very accurate way of uh, calculating your dose, you can always use the dose software that we provide as well. <laughs> just a very quick, very tiny plug. Um, another question that's come in is, is the silica contamination specific to your experiment or is it more general and originates from the chips themselves? It originates from the chips themselves. Um, so this is what I mean about it having been confirmed by other universities. Um, they did it, they did these experiments and so did we actually on chips with no sample and we see the same effect. It is a water plus silicon nitride plus, plus beam effect. Um, it's made worse by working at low pressures. I don't fully understand that either. But uh, at first, like I said, we thought we were going crazy, but um, it has been confirmed by other groups who have discovered this independently from us. So now I feel confident in saying this is legitimately a problem. Um, but yeah, so it unfortunately just general to all experiments. Um, we, we did debate graphene coating our chips in order to prevent it, but that isn't something we've actually done yet. Okay, great. Um, in due to time, I'm just going to do one or two more questions because uh, we're already at time, but uh, Savannah can answer any more questions as well. We save all of these, so then I'll send them through to you. 
Um, and if you have any more questions, you can always also send them to support the prototypes and then we can send them again on to Savannah uh, for her to answer. So uh, someone says, hello, thank you very much for the very informative webinar. You mentioned that there can sometimes be a very, very small leak in the holder that the microscope still runs and vacuum does not break in the microscope despite the leak. So how can such a small leak affect the experiment? I'm guessing that if gases are not flowing and are static, we may end up with no gases in the cell and the reaction may not happen. But what if the gases are flowing? Can this affect the reaction in any way? So, <laughs> so actually, um, one thing you should know about the manifold is uh, that the pressure in the tip, the way it's calculated is actually live. So it's basing it on the, uh, or like the flow is actually live. So the number you get for the flow especially is actually live. So it's calculating it based on the difference between the tank, um, the, the, the mixing tank and the vacuum tank. So it's basing it on that. Um, and so you, your, your flow rate that you get, even if you have a leak out into the microscope will be real. However, the actual pressure that, you're, that it says you have in the tip is not necessarily real. So that wouldn't do, so the difficulty doesn't come from the fact that you, would change your reaction necessarily because I don't think you would but it means that you wouldn't be accurately reporting the pressure that you have in the tip so if you're okay with saying that the pressure was between you know this and this for your actual experiment then it doesn't really matter but it does matter if you want to accurately say okay well we did our reaction at this pressure but you want to compare pressures it becomes very hard because yeah you you don't have an accurate number for that well, thank you so much. Um, so much. And with that, I see that we are at our time. Um, I am uh, quickly thanking you as well. Thank you so much for your attendance and uh, everybody for the attendance and you for your presentation. It was really, really lovely. Um, this webinar it will also be put online. So uh, if you want to rewatch parts or you miss a little bit, you can always watch it on YouTube. Um, and then I just want to quickly say if you want to also enroll for any of the other webinars that we have coming up you can go to our website or our linkedin uh, there's always posts coming out with new webinars the next one will be on the 6th of december and will be all about FE, fib so fit preparation for in situ tdm thank you again savannah turner for your lovely presentation and you for your attendance and um, with that i'd like to close the webinar bye bye